Hello everyone and welcome to part 3 of uh, my opening repertoire guide with the move uh, 1 to e6. So in the last video we discussed what to do against 1d4 and there I recommended playing 1e6 and after a move maybe like c5, d5 and this gets into our typical Queen's Gambit decline structures. And we covered a nice easy setup with uh, knight coming to f6, bishop to e7, and then castling on the king's side. So a nice straightforward setup that black can get into. And this covers quite a lot of, um, of theory that black will need to learn against 1d4. In this video though, I'm going to cover what to do against uh, 1e4. And again, I'm going to be recommending the move 1e6. And this gets into what is known as the French defence. And we, we discussed a little bit, a few of the lines in the introduction. But um, I'll go into a bit more detail of um, what I'm going to be recommending in this opening repertoire. If you want, as I say, a very solid position, less theoretically challenging, but also a position that's easy to get into and cuts down on the theory as much as possible. After d4, d5. And we get into the French defence. And here there are, I would say, five different variations that are popular. Um, we're going to look at today this knight move by either coming to uh, d f d2 or to c3. And these two moves are the most popular moves that can be played. But I'll also in future videos look at what to do against the exchange variation. What to do against uh, e5. And if I go back just one move also what to do against d3. Which is known as the uh, king's Indian attack. A very uh, popular system that white can also get into against the French defence. So going back then, so let's focus our attention on what to do against these two moves. And what's handy about this opening repertoire is what if even if he plays against C if he plays C3 or D2, I'm going to be recommending that you play the move uh, D takes on E4. And this is known as the Rubenstein variation. So one thing I really want to achieve with this opening repertoire, guys, an easy way of cutting down on opening three. So with this Rubenstein variation, it's a less theoretically challenging line, but with the advantage that you can play it against both knight to c3 and knight to d2. So um, for black, the advantages for yourself is if you play quite a lot of games with this position, is um, you're going to be um, more... I guess uh, more ready or more prepared uh, to play these sort of positions than white. This might be the first time white's ever seen this position and as a result might struggle against your uh, battle hardened experience that you might have gained in this variation. So knight takes on e4. So I would say universally white will capture here and from this position white definitely has a small advantage already um, he's got the strong center, uh, he's got a piece developed, um, he's going to have an easy time, but Black argues that with that pawn exchange, uh, he's gotten rid of one of the central pawns, so he's tried to calm down the position a little bit, and he's also got a more solid pawn structure maybe for later on in the game. There's no real weaknesses in Black's position here, so it's up to White to use his space advantage, use his lead and developments to try and create um, a bit of an advantage against Black. And if White fails to do that, or if he doesn't capitalize on these two uh, advantages for him, he'll find that his, his advantage quickly um, uh, disappears and Black will get a nice even uh, position to play with. So, in this position, there are two, well, there's actually three popular moves here. Um, the most popular is knights to d7. And this goes into mainline Rubenstein territories. So it's known as the Blackburn defense. Uh, but here, I'm not going to be recommending that. I'm going to be recommending um, bishop to d7. So this is uh, Black's second most popular continuation, and it's a very unusual move. Um, here, Black hopes to immediately solve the problem of his bad bishop on c8 by looking to develop it to c6. Uh, Black does lose a tempo in doing this. Uh, however, he argues his solid Fort Knox-like defence will be very difficult to crack. And uh, I, I say Fort Knox-like defence, that's the reason why it's called the Fort Knox variation. It's very difficult to break down Black's position. 
As I said earlier, White does get a small edge in this opening, uh, since he has total control of the centre and the advantage of space. So his pieces will be able to move more freely around the board, and it'll be easier to control a lot of Black's counterplay and control the flow of the game if you have control of the centre. <laughs> So white will typically play a normal developing move, so knight to f3 makes sense here. And bishop to c6, so now black threatens to capture on e4. But he also might capture on f3, trading off his bad light squared bishop. Um, now, whether or not this is good or not, I don't know, because simply because black has had to waste two tempos in trying to get this bishop out. And in the process, white is going to just speed up ahead in development. Um, but I guess the argument is, again, as I say, we can get rid of our bad bishop straight away. We don't have to worry about this bishop becoming entombed in our position that we can sometimes find in some French defence positions or even Queen's Gambit decline positions. Bishop to d3. So defending the knights from capture on e4. And... Um, here, black can play knight to d7. Um, so, the idea of this move is to prepare the move knight g to f6. Uh, if I go back one move, I would say very quickly, capturing here is uh, not recommended, um, since this immediately gives up the bishop pair for very little compensation. Now, after the bishop captures an e4, Black is going to have to waste a tempo playing c6 um, if he tries to do knights to f6 to try and chase away this bishop. You'll notice here that immediately this bishop can capture. Um, so really I wouldn't recommend it at this point. Late in the position though, it is a very good move to play. So knight to d7. White will simply castle. White gets on with development. And knight g to f6. So now threatening to capture on uh, the e4 square and there are a few moves that white can play here uh, the most popular move the best move is knights to g3 so avoiding the capture where it would look now to um, influence the center still from g3 but also aid in any kingside assaults very quickly though i will just quickly look make a mention of what happens after a knight captures an f6 well, this is playable, but it's not recommended. And here, white concedes the centre, but also allows for an interesting recapture. So you might think that just capturing the knight would be the best move. In fact, uh, queen captures an f6 is even better. So now white, uh, black is threatening to capture uh, the knight on c3. Um, and if white, let's say, ignores that, and let's say he plays maybe c3 or something, then... Bishop captures, Queen captures, and you'll see here that Black has inflicted some serious damage on White's kingside, crippling him and giving him two isolated double pawns, which he'll use as for potential targets later on in the position. The only pluses for White here is the fact that he's got a solid center and he's got the bishop pair, but I would say that this, this structural weakness is more of enough reason to give Black a small edge in this position. Going back then, so c3 doesn't really work. Um, so the actual best move here for white is actually bishop e2. So it loses a tempo, but it does prevent capture. Since you know now, if I tried to capture with the knight uh, with the bishop, then this is pretty good for white. He hasn't lost any tempo here. In fact, he's now black's going to have to waste a tempo playing c6 here. Um, so white's doing slightly better. So e3 is the best move, um, but then after bishop to d6, black is caught up in development here now, um, and he's got a lot of options here for himself. He can now castle both long, but he could also castle short here, defending, depending on what sort of uh, game he wants to play. But going back though, very quickly, if uh, white is foolish, he might try this little trap, he might go into this trap line for uh, for black and play bishop to g5 and this is a, actually a mistake for uh, white since now black can capture on f3 now threatening the queen and if let's say white captures here himself black can capture the queen 
You might try and capture on g7, trying to play Desperado, win a few things. Uh, but now after bishop takes on g7 and f takes on d1, if you count the material, notice here that black is actually up an exchange here. So this is actually not very good for white at all. And again, just going back to this position, if let's say the bishop runs away, let's say, then uh, the bishop will run away himself. And again, if you count the material, you'll see that black is still ahead in material. So definitely not a good line. Definitely avoid going on the line if you're playing as white. So let's go back a little bit. So obviously, that's why white will try and avoid any exchanges. His argument is obviously in the position like this, where black has got its space disadvantage, he'll be looking to try and get as many exchanges as possible since he'll argue that since his pawn structure is so solid that he'll have a good game going into the end game if he tries to exchange as many pieces as possible and white since he's got the space advantage if he tries to make too many pawn moves he might create some future problems for himself in the end game okay so bishop to e7 so black continues his solid setup um, the idea of this is obviously he'll set up his solid setup and only after then he'll try and challenge white. So bishop e7, this is very similar to what we what you've saw in the, the Queen's Gambits uh, video that I looked at. Again, we're getting the bishop to d e7, knight to f6, very similar positions, and we're looking to castle potentially next move. Rook to e1, castles, and c3. So um, with this move, white is bolstering his uh, the square on e4 by protecting the pawn on d4. Um, now black can potentially play maybe not uh, rook to e1, so getting some trying to contest on this uh, semi-open e file. Uh, bishop to f4, and here black if he wants it wants to can actually capture an f3 here now and black argues that whilst he's given up the bishop pair he does get rid of his bad bishop immediately and we discussed at the beginning of the game you know it's a good it's, if we can get rid of this bishop we don't have to worry about it ever becoming entombed um, like it could have done earlier on in the game um, and now it's the perfect time to do it since since he's developed a lot of his pieces now he can now focus on uh, getting rid of this bishop and then creating a more solid position. So, after bit, queen takes an f3, c6, black has achieved his rock solid setup. Um, with that said, his position is rather passive. Uh, it does make it very difficult to achieve counterplay in this position. However, if black can remain firm and solid, he can make his opponent's life difficult in capitalizing on his small and his slight advantage. Typical plans for black would be maybe to try and get his queen to a5, maybe his rook to c1, and then starting to try and push these queen side pawns. He's got a minority attack here because he's got three pawns versus four pawns here. So he'd be looking to try and exchange off three of these pawns for f uh, maybe three of these pawns to create a potential isolated pawn at some point in the future. So that's that's Black's plan. His position is very solid, but White does have some pluses as well. The fact that he's got a very solid setup, he's got a strong center. Uh, it's gonna be very difficult for Black to really achieve much counterplay since White has so much control of the uh, position here. So um, that's the only drawback of this, of this variation. With that said though, um, I would I would argue that Black has got an easy time to try and uh, um, to try and fight in this position. He's um, got his opening theory down to a very easy, manageable position. You see here from the from the first twelve moves, Black's kind of got a desirable position. But this can occur. This sort of easy setup can occur in so many different things that White will play. Uh, and it's very easy to remember, very easy to play. If I go back to the beginning, again, we our first kind of six moves, in fact, or five moves, I should say, are pretty much autopilot. 
you know, we're going to get the bishop to d7, c6, going to get the knight to d7, and then play the knight to f6. Bishop coming to e7, and then castling. That's all we're doing. It's really quite straightforward setup that we can play. And whatever really white plays in this position, we're going to do okay here. If we want a bit more of an aggressive game, we can also play the move bishop to uh, d6 as well. That works in some positions, and that can also be very effective as well, if we prefer it instead of the more passive uh, e7 as well. All right, and that's um, that's really it from the Fort Knox. So if I just go to the final position here, as you can see here, Black has achieved his setup really solid, really strong, uh, a great little um, opening to learn for Black, and that kind of covers, I would say, about sixty percent of your repertoire already. So we've looked at the Queen's Gambit declined, a solid setup there. We've looked at the Fort Knox French. Now the only things we need to learn now are just things like the advance variation and the exchange variation and also the potential uh, Queen's Indian attack, uh, sorry, King's Indian attack, I should say. And we're pretty much there with our opening repertoire. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this video. Do look out for the third part, uh, or I should say the fourth part, I should say, um, and um, I'll try and get those videos out as soon as possible. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.